Welcome to the OnScript podcast, your home for world-class conversations on scripture and theology, where you get to meet some of the best in the field. Visit us at onscript.study. Say hello on Twitter at OnScript Podcast and stop by our Facebook page at facebook.com slash OnScript. Hey everyone, welcome back to the OnScript Podcast. This is Matt Lynch coming to you from Regent College in Vancouver. As we start out, I just want to say a special thanks to Alan Files and James Steinbeck, who have been working behind the scenes to sort out some tech issues, and it's just been so helpful. So there are a lot of people that help make this possible, including a lot of you who give regularly uh, to support us. So thanks so much to all of you as well. And if you would like to uh, support the podcast, you can go to onscript.study forward slash donate to do so uh, or share the word. Coming up on the holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, etc., opportune times to share the word with your extended family. So I'll just leave that with you. Take it where you want. And thanks so much for listening. Hello, OnScript listeners. This is Aaron Hine coming to you from Wycliffe Hall, University of Oxford, where I am sitting here today in the flesh, in person, uh, with our guest, Dr. Matt Novenson who is Senior Lecturer in New Testament and Christian Origins at the University of Edinburgh. Matt is here to discuss his newest book, Paul Then and Now, which is a really excellent uh, collection of his essays, um, which was published by Erdman's in 2022. Matt, welcome back to OnScript. Uh, Thanks very much, Aaron. It's a a pleasure to be here. This, This new book, Matt, is another mile marker in your what is now a, a pretty lengthy journey as a Pauline scholar. Your first book, Christ Among the Messiahs, Christ Language in, um, in Paul and Messiah Language in Ancient Judaism, that was published in 2012. And you make a number of references in this new book to a book that's called um, The End of the Law and the Last Man, Paul Between Judaism and Christianity, which is forthcoming forthcoming with Cambridge. How, how forthcoming is forthcoming? What... Uh, very. That manuscript's being submitted next month. Oh, that's excellent. So, I mean, my question is, how did you first get interested in Paul's letters? And then what's kept you interested enough to, you know, be on book number three in Paul? Yeah, probably the most significant influence for getting me interested in Paul's letters is a, uh, someone who's a friend and influence of both of ours is Beverly Gaventa who ended up being my doctoral supervisor, but whom I first had as a, uh, when I was a master's student. Um, and I took, I, I took a couple of courses with her during that degree, but one that was an exegesis of Romans course that was just really, uh, influential in lots of ways, but in particular kind of, you know, one of those ones that a course that kind of lights a, a fire for you, raises all kinds of questions and makes you think there's more to do. So, um, I, yeah, I mean, I had read and had, was generally interested in the letters of Paul before that, but I think before that course, uh, I wasn't a PhD student yet, but I imagined doing a PhD on something, not Paul, uh, on something with, uh, ancient Jewish history or maybe the historical Jesus. But after that course, I, I decided I wanted to do something on Paul. Um, so that, that was, it's all, Beverly Gaventa's faults in that in that respect. Um, she is infectious in her love for Paul. I think she is genuinely infectious as a as a teacher, <laughs> and and through, I think in writing too. But certainly, if you hear a lecture, it's, uh, yeah, and that's a uh, that's just a wonderful trait in a teacher. I think is to, mm-hmm. um, yeah. And then uh, I've stuck with it just because you you feel like you sort out one little issue or problem and then something else pops up mm. you say oh that i mean you took it you took a slight detour with detour with grammar of messianism i mean obviously that's related to your first book but it's yeah that was uh that was a case where i had worked i mean the phd thesis is maybe feels like the most exhausting book you you write maybe i mean I've, for me it, uh did it's the first time you have to do that big a project uh and that became then my first book. And then so having just done Paul for so long, and mm-hmm. then I wanted to do something else. But by the time that second book was done, I was ready to read Paul again. Yeah. And, but it, it, it for me, it's been an experience of 
you solve one problem and then it raises other questions elsewhere. And then if you have the the energy to do it, then yeah. then you go chase down that next problem. So what's the what's the problem you're chasing in the book that's forthcoming? Uh it's um the problem I'm chasing is trying to explain the Paul and Judaism debates, like why that is such a bee in the bonnet of New Testament studies and has been for decades or even centuries. Hmm. Um, so in that sense, it's kind of, uh, this is risky, but it's a Paul and Judaism book, another one. Uh, but I, I ended up coming to a hypothesis about sort of uh, there's two levels in the book. One is try to give a reading of Paul, but the other is diagnosing why why this is a hang up mm. for us, for New right. Testament scholars. Um, so that's what I was chasing, and then I end up with a kind of hypothesis, trying to explain what what makes that whole thing tick, right? In the letters, and then in the history of uh, scholars, above all, uh, Christian scholars trying to you know obsessing over the issue of Paul and Judaism. Right. Well, we'll look forward to that when, when it comes out. We'll have to have you back. Um, at one point in your book, and I struggled to find this when I was re redoing these or writing these questions, but at one point, I know you say that you're quite happy to be, a, which I think you, the phrase you use is a hermeneutical relativist. Um, but you, you think maybe others aren't quite so keen to, to kind of sit in that space. So what do you mean by hermeneutical relativist? Um, why are you one and why do you think others maybe are less keen to inhabit that posture? Yeah, by the phrase hermeneutical relativists, I mean, uh, I acknowledge that uh, there are lots of different ways of reading any text, uh, including biblical texts, mm -hmm. including Pauline texts, and that uh, while there are there are some of them that we might have reasons for just calling bad or complete non-starters. There's lots of ones that are potentially good, depending what it is we're trying to do with the reading, mm. right? Um, so in, uh, I mean, I, I take a lot of this theory of hermeneutics from uh, Jeffrey Stout, philosopher of religion. Um, but in biblical studies, actually, I mean, we're in Oxford, and so this is on the brain, but uh, Akma Adam, uh, uh, another mutual friend and colleague of ours, has this great book from a number of years ago about making mm -hmm. sense of New Testament theology mm -hmm. that was influential for me this way, just talking about, he was taking apart an old assumption in our field that uh, uh, sort of first you do textual criticism, and then once you have that sorted out, then you do various kinds of historical criticism, and then once all that's in order, you know, whatever's, whatever's you've distilled out, you can hand over for biblical theology to think about. And then once they're done, right, then <laughs> systematic or constructive theologians can have a go. Yeah. And it's a, a very foundationalist picture is a term that ACMA and others use. Um, and I come to think influenced by him and some others that that's, uh, that is the way sort of the history of our discipline has often viewed it but it's not how we actually read things or mm. or think things usually um there are different reading strategies can be networked related in various ways but they're not stacked on top of each other and sometimes to do one kind of task you don't actually need a particular other one mm -hmm. um so uh i could read a a really boldly unapologetically theological exegesis of something in Romans or something, and then a very, you know, social history, early Roman Empire kind of, which would look like they would really clash, and they might be in different SBL groups that, you know, would never, but I might, each other. <laughs> I might think, no, those are both right, actually, relative to the, to the rules they're playing by, to the kind of thing mm -hmm. they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. I might also think either of them had problems, but again, relative to the rules they were playing by. Uh, hmm. So, yeah, by hermeneutical relativist, I'm thinking of that, you know, SBL groups that don't talk to each other dynamic. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, there are some readings that we, all of us might, you know, could just call bad. But often 
there's a lot of quite good ones that are just playing by rather different rules because they have different purposes and that's legit. And, um, so that's what I mean by it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the reason I think most of us in our field are not as comfortable, uh, flying that flag is that, uh, I think maybe a lot of us have an intuition just that, um, you know, whatever, whatever reading we like to do or are trained to do is the right, is the, the bet is mm-hmm. the good kind. Right. And whatever the game we're playing is the right game and other people are playing. Yeah. There's something less good game. <laughs> that's right. I mean, there's something very deep and human psychological about that. Uh, and then part of, a part of it is from our training. I mean, there's a, there is a, mm-hmm. there's a, there is a virtue in a theological curriculum that sort of trains you to do textual criticism, historical context, mm-hmm. canonical or biblical. Theory. That's all great, but, uh, it over systematized. Well, it may, it may be just fine for students perhaps, but it, it over systematizes if it makes us think that sort of, you know, if, if you just put the text through that particular industrial process, yeah, then the one and only true meaning will emerge. That's a mistake. Uh, mm. And I, I wondered as, as you were sort of, um, well, as I've heard you reflect on it now, and as you were reflecting on it in the book a little bit, how much of that um, is linked to a particular idea of what these texts are? The, the sort of unwillingness perhaps to play different games. Yeah, that's a very, yeah. I think certainly on the side of religiously committed readers, right? I mean, in the case of Letters of Paul, because it's Christian scripture, Christian readers who want to read theologically, like for theology, or want to read confessionally, that is sort of by the canons of their own Mm -hmm. tradition. I mean, that's a really classic case and where, I mean, you can see the reasons for it, where there's an especially strong conviction there that this is the right way to read it because, uh, not just because it's the way I happen to read it, but because God is involved, right? And so, um, if this is God's way of reading it, then that really amps up the yeah the criticism yeah. that raised against others who don't read it that way right i mean and, and that's well and there's got to be a temporal dimension to that too if this is not just it's not i mean it part of it is maybe that it's god's way of reading it but part of it par- perhaps also is that because it's christian scripture it's always timely mm. and there's you know it's not there's a maybe a less of a um mm. there's a discomfort leaving paul letting paul be weird in the past yeah and leaving Paul in his weird past. Yeah. Uh, yes. No, that's uh, that's right. I, I cite in the book, I mean, one classic example of this, which I first read in Beverly Gaventa's Romans course, <laughs> is the famous, like, the list of all the prefaces. There's like six or seven prefaces yeah. to uh, Karl Barth's commentary on Romans, uh, in, and, and in which he said this, where he kind of... Um, he says, I have nothing against historical criticism, but, right? And yeah. he says, actually, it's, you know, barely even crossing the starting line toward actually interpreting yeah. text. And to interpret the text for Bart, says, has to be uh, s- standing beside Paul, as it were, looking at the same subject matter together so mm-hmm. that the, the centuries between us fall away. Mm. Um, and that's the only thing that counts ultimately as a commentary or as interpretation. Uh, and I mean, that'll, you know, in Christian terms, that'll preach. Uh, <laughs> I, I like, I get the idea, mm. but I don't know to me. And I say this as someone who is also a Christian reader, but empirically that's not true. Like that's not, that's not the only thing that counts as reading a text. You might mm-hmm. think it's the most important mm-hmm. or the only one that, in the last reckoning, you know, really, really counts or something, but it is not the only way of reading a text. <laughs> sure. Um, so, I mean, certainly in our fields, because of its history wrapped up with church history, that's the most prominent kind of non-hermeneutical relativism, right? Of a kind of yeah. 
but there are, uh, and I discussed this some in the book too, right? I mean, there are, it comes from numerous different quarters. So there are, uh, historical, critical, or religious studies approaches mm -hmm. to reading the letters of Paul or the biblical text to say, actually, if you're not doing it this way, you're not really reading it. Like that a theological reading is not a proper reading of a text that mm -hmm. it's special pleading or it's, so it's, you know, stones get thrown on all sides. Um, and it's not that everyone can just be right all the time, but I do think if you say, well, what game is it you're playing? Like, what are you after when you're reading it? Yeah. Then you could, one could tolerate a lot more of the hmm. reading strategies that happen than we normally do. Yeah. Well, and you, you do that really well um, because the, the groups that you're mentioning, I think, you know, it, by and large, they don't, it's not just that they don't talk to each other. There's like some active animosity going on in some of those, in some of those scholarly discussions um, in those different sections of SBL. And somehow you manage to have these like really warm collegial relationships with with everybody, which I think, you know, is not I mean, and, and it comes across in your writing, too, that there's a, a generosity there in scholarship that I think um, is just really helpful. So I really appreciated that part of the book. And I, I I was happy to see you kind of name that as hermeneutical relativism, but in a like, a I think, a really helpful way. Um, so, yeah, thank you for that. Let's jump into the content um, of the book in your first chapter. Um, you have these, you seem to, and to me, you had these two sort of related pleas. Um, one of them is that we shouldn't dismiss the usefulness of historical criticism, which in some cir you know circles is sort of trendy <laughs> um, to say, actually, historical criticism has sort of had its day and we need to, to think, I mean, not just within theological circles, but in, you know, feminist studies, feminist readings, postcolonial readings, et cetera. Um, so you say, let's, let's hold on to this as a useful set of hermeneutical tools. Um, and then kind of correlated with that, you have this phrase, make Paul weird again. Um, so what do you see as the ongoing value in the historical critical method? Um, and then how does that relate to making Paul weird? Yeah. Um, the ongoing value in historical critical method uh, if if we if we, in maybe method's not the right word. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> a I have so I've I've came to realize while researching and writing this book and that chapter that actually this is a really interesting issue that the phrase historical critical method or historical criticism is a it's really slippery. Mm. Um, I uh, and I think I have come to think it's because. It's used or not used in different, or it's, this is a sociological point, uh, in different corners of the subfield. Mm. So there's a great, I quote this, I think, in the book, there's a great recent discussion of this by Lara Nasrallah in her Paul and Archaeology book, mm. where she kind of says, to hell with historical criticism, because it, as, as she sort of uh, specifies it, is uh, a... Uh, a really arrogant and a naively uh, objectivist uh, uh, project imagines that sort of, you know, you could be a mind in a vat and have unmediated access to the past and pin everything down entirely and know everything and say everything there is to say. Uh, so to Nasrallah, that's what the term suggests. Hmm. And so if, when I read her, her treatment, I go, well, yeah, I mean, that's, I don't want to, I don't want to be on board with that. <laughs> But then I realized, I think of historical criticism, and I think this is because I was probably taught it, and this is basically what it is, uh, in, a, in, a, in, in a much more minimalist sense, hmm. is it's a grab bag of tools for asking questions about the past, as opposed for asking questions about the present and our lives, or questions about God and what God is like. You know, the historical criticism just means it's when we talk about past stuff and you know, for New Testament scholars, that means basically early Roman Empire, um, Roman Near East, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that, it seems to me, I mean, we could, some people do say, no, I literally have zero interest in that, right? And don't want to play that game. Um, but I have, I, I actually don't know, I don't think it matters. I don't think I would sort of go to, go to, uh, 
to bat to insist that everyone keep using the historical critical method or anything like that. He's giving air quotes. It's probably important to say that. Yeah. The, uh, so it's not, the term isn't sacred in any way to me, but, uh, but I realized, I think, I think of it as a kind of not that special and even benign force because I learned it mostly coming out of a, a theological curriculum. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, it was at Princeton Theological Seminary where I was studying with Beverly Cavenza at the time where if you come from a traditional theological curriculum, then there's systematic theology and church history and so on. And then in biblical studies, it intersects with those. But historical criticism is this thing that helps us unpick uh, what the text might mean that's different from what uh, the Mormon Declaration or the Nicene Creed or Thomas's Summa uh, met. Or, uh, and so it's, oh, okay, it's just that. It's just what helps me understand it in first century terms as opposed to fourth century terms or 20th century terms. Mm. Uh, but Nasrallah is also right that in the history of our discipline, uh, right, it, there are some absurd excesses uh, of, of, yeah, hermeneutical arrogance around uh, what historical criticism could conceivably do coming out of the Enlightenment and so on. Um, so I have no interest in defending any of that. But I do think that uh, it's uh, if historical criticism could mean just asking questions about the human past, then that's worthwhile. Mm. Um, it's not the only thing we need to do. We don't have to do it necessarily to underwrite other things we might want to do, like ask questions about our like ethical issues today or about mm. God. But it might it, it might sometimes be handy. Uh, and yeah, and so the. So does that does a historical critical reading of Paul always lead us to Paul being weird? Uh, not always and everywhere necessarily, uh, but in a, in a in a large number of cases maybe. Um, I think, yeah. I mean, that, that's that's a very good question. Uh, I, another friend was asking me this at one point. Said something like, "So." Is any because I use this phrase first of all in reference to Paula Fredrickson's work? He said, "Is it is any weird reading of Paul right? Therefore, just because it's not what you know modern mm-hmm. people believe, and no, that's not true. And it's also not the case that you know the weirder it is, the more <laughs> accurate it necessarily is, right? But uh, it does highlight the cutting edge of what." asking ancient historical questions historical criticism can do and that's just to show the ways in which paul is uh there are there are a number of respects in which paul is like uh augustine or thomas or us Mm. but there's other ways in which he's unlike and it's asking the historical questions that helps us see the difference between you and i sitting in oxford in the 21st century (laughs) right versus uh you know Luther in his Augustinian cell in the 16th century mm-hmm. uh, versus Augustine in the in the fifth or Paul in the first, and so and so weirdness there just singles the those gaps that that are there, but that a lot of well, especially theological readings, their whole well, not necessarily, but in a lot of cases, and Bart's uh, formulation is a really great example of this. The whole point. Is to make the gaps disappear, mm. right? Uh, like that's what it says on the tin. That's what it's. <laughs> um, and again, for certain purposes, there's a virtue in that. But on the other hand, that instantly makes you forget mm. all the ways in which maybe the text doesn't, or at one point when he wrote it, didn't mean mm-hmm. that because that is not what I presently believe about God or Jesus or uh, and. So even if you end up discarding a lot of those, as we think you may have to do for theological purposes, you're surely better off for having thought those thoughts, right? Mm. For having seen what it, what it might have meant. I suppose my, my follow-up question to that, or just something that occurs to me as we're talking, so if this is the wrong question, I'm sorry, but does that, does that make Paul weird in light of, you know, Paul not being Augustine, not being Luther, not being us? Does that allow for Paul being weird in his own context. Because that, I think, 
um, I think is one of my sort of continual, I suppose, not hangups with historical criticism, but I, I do wonder to the extent, like the extent to which we might allow Paul to be saying something that doesn't have a historical precedent or parallel that we can see in another text. Mm. Like, can Paul be weird and new in that respect? Yeah, that's a no. That's a very perceptive question. Uh, yes, no, quite right. Uh, I mean, the the potential weakness in in the slogan "Make Paul Weird Again" or just you know, va- valorizing the quest for weirdness. Mm is that misstep I was mentioning before that you say, oh, if I found a weird reading, that's got to be right. Uh, so it, it, you set up this criterion, an artificial criterion that... Uh, but I guess my question is, he's not really weird. If it, Like the weirdness comes from he not being like us, not yeah. not being like something else in the first century. Weirdness is, yes. The, 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 the weakness in using the term weird as a criterion is it's relative. Weirdness is relative to what's yeah. not weird, which is conventional right. or normal or something like that. And so if, as you're right, I mean, this is how I used it. If I'm talking, if I'm, when I use the phrase, I mean, weird relative to us, mm. then actually that just underdetermines. It doesn't even answer the question about, okay, what if we were just comparing him to everything else in a first century context? Mm. Um, and I do think there are some recent treatments, some recent uh, like discussions of Paul that are more on the, on the side of this uh, reading Paul weirdly, so to speak that and maybe i'm guilty of some of this myself uh but what i had i have thought when i've read them uh yeah m- maybe that's right but i haven't learned much yet if you just say the kind of treatment i mean is one that says i'm going to and i get i know i'm guilty of saying this in some papers <laughs> and i'm going to resituate paul in this ancient context mm. right we understand if we understand that paul fits at you know as a you know, a religious entrepreneur in a in a sure. setting of uh, religious competition in the early Roman Empire, or mm-hmm. uh, Paul as a uh, diviner, or Paul as a popular philosopher, or po- right. Uh, when we do historical critical studies like that, let's say I'm going to resituate Paul in context X, and then you say, "There, look, there it is." Uh, and sometimes there are really interesting results that come out of that, and sometimes. Not so much. Sometimes he said, well, okay, you said you were going to situate him there. You did it. <laughs> and But the the conclusion was already there in the premise. So I don't know. Um, uh, because not all religious entrepreneurs are alike in every respect. Not all mm-hmm. diviners, not all popular philosophers are alike in every respect. And so sure. some are weird relative to others. <laughs> um, so I think that's right. I, I would say that's just the the worry embedded in your question is right weird is i find it helpful for sort of shaking us out of mm. complacency i mean i do too i don't want to minimize yeah, that <laughs> but it way under determines any conclusions right it's the beginning not the end of yeah sure uh, inquiry i mean it's something i say like my if my students were sitting in this room with us they would attest that i'm always saying and this is really weird that he says this like let's not pretend that this is something that we think is normal you know when we read you know when we immediately jump to I mean, I teach at a theological institution, so most of my students are thinking always to their context, not Paul's context. So it takes me a while to say, no, he's really talking about food, you know, sacrifice to idols if we're in Corinthians. And he's like, and they're like, well, I don't, I don't even know what that would mean, yeah. you know? And it's, but I have to say like, this is weird and yeah. we don't, yeah. So I don't want to denigrate the question, but then I, I just wonder if we're, when we make him weird for our context if we also then sort of take away his distinctiveness in his own context i think that's my hang up but it's a small hang up because in general i find that it's a really helpful phrase help i mean helpful pedagogically and then helpful in terms of shaking up the call the scholarly conversation um okay so to ask i mean i have a lot of questions along (laughs) this line because i think um it's a it's the line you know it's sort of the line that you're you're driving in this book throughout most of the chapters is this, yeah, this question of sort of whence and whether Pauline studies and um, what we mean by Paul and Paulinism. So I'm just going to, you know, keep going along this track um, and, and try to get, I suppose, into some of the more specific questions. Um, 
So you have this chapter on um, Paul and Paulinism in Romans 1 and 2. <laughs> mm. and, uh, and you say in that chapter, and I'm going to quote you now, Romans 1 and 2, like the rest of Scripture, but more so, lies before us between theology and historical criticism, accessible to us by both avenues, but not at the same time. And that's okay. We are professionals. We are trained to handle complications of this sort. Which <laughs> made me laugh out loud because, you know, well, because it's funny. And also because uh, I think you might give us all a little too much credit. <laughs> but it, um, I just, I wonder, my question is, um, you know, does that, does that potentially draw too sharp a line between history and theology? Um and I, I wonder if if the divide between those things two two disciplines is really as great as the rift is between the Pauline scholars who do theological readings and the Pauline scholars who do historical readings. Like, are the disciplines necessarily that far apart, or do we pretend that they're that far apart because the people who do them don't really like to talk to each other? <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, that's a good that's a good way of putting it. I suspect that is the case, right? That they're but actually uh, in in our actual practice, this it's basically sociological factors <laughs> come out in front, right? And so people, we have the conversations we want to have with other people that we <laughs> that we want to talk to, and not with, yeah. And and so and then we we reverse engineer it so that so that there's different sub disciplines here that can happen or something. Yeah. That's that's really perceptive. I think that's probably true. Um I think part of what I argue, I think I say in that chapter, is it's actually well, um, again, this is a bit of hermeneutical relativism. Mm. Um there are some kinds of interpreters, some of us, who just won't be interested in asking others certain kind of questions at all. And I say that's fine. They don't have to. I mean, the most obvious case would be, right? I mean, there's, there are uh, increasingly in, in 21st century scholarship, it is less and less the case that New Testament studies, biblical studies is the, uh, you know, is a, a cloistered project of Christian scholars, mm. um, which it has long been. And I mean, in, you know, in the not too distant past, it was all clergy. Mm. Then some, you know, a few lay Christians slipped in. <laughs> Uh, and then it's a more and more genuinely pluralistic uh, mm -hmm. undertaking demographically. I think that's true, even if in New Testament studies, Christians and in Pauline studies, Protestants are still <laughs> uh, right, very much dominant. But I think there's a clear direction of travel mm. um, that I, I, that on balance is great, I think. Um, but there are, for instance, then lots of really interesting non-Christian readers of Paul now. Mm -hmm. Uh, who, well, it's actually not the case that uh, a non-Christian reader of Paul might have no interest in theological readings or even Christian theological readings, but a lot won't. I mean, uh, a lot uh, are on record as saying they don't have that kind of interest, right? Sure. And one of my points is that's perfectly fine. Hmm. Likewise, in principle, right, there are uh, other Christian scholars of Paul who just say, I mean, I really don't give a damn about historical criticism and I don't mm -hmm. intend to ever do any such readings, which again, I, I have no problem saying, <laughs> uh, that's great, off, off you go, you know, uh, but uh, there, are, uh, there are a lot of different kind of reading strategies mm -hmm. that all of us, whatever our particular backgrounds, demographic categories might all be interested in, mm -hmm even if to varying degrees or in different and and so i i um one of the arguments of that chapter is let's not i mean as a constructive proposal let's not reduce it to sociology just so that mm. you know you get all the christian readers in one room doing theological readings <laughs> and all the uh you know uh non-religiously committed readers in a different room doing uh critical theory of religion kind of readings or something like that mm. because the different reading strategies uh, can possibly be done and in fact are done all the time within the same human mind. Sure. Right? And so we should actually, I, I think ideally, uh, try to check the 
the tribal impulse that is natural to all of us, right? And mm-hmm. say, and and think of it as I myself, any particular interpreter could ask these different kinds of questions. Mm-hmm. Um, and so in that sense, I hope I'm kind of bringing them together saying like, yeah, actually the, the, it's not a, the difference is not one between tribes of interpreters. The difference is between questions sure. within the mind of any of us. And that therefore, I mean, that I find that really, um, freeing or exciting or something because then it means if I have that question and you have that question and someone else has that question Mm. whether any of us is uh, Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, atheist uh, whatever gender, whatever nationality or whatever we might all be able to learn something by asking this question together like anyone who shares that question could have a really interesting discussion of it but the the other side of that coin which is perhaps liable to some criticism uh, which is an issue raised in your question is uh, do we then drive a wedge between the different questions or reading strategies like i said you can't do the historical criticism and theology at the same time mm. uh i would want to say i'm not driving a wedge or like putting a gulf between them i'm i'm just basically calling for clarity okay uh and within in the way my m- mind works at least like i find this helpful just to say at this exact moment am i asking you know what paul probably meant by this in the mm. mid first century or am i asking what's a tolerable christian account of the nature of god or am i asking you know what ethically what must i right now in the life I live mm. do in relation to uh, the relations between men and women in, in churches for yeah. uh, in, in relation to the, the problem of the enslavement of other humans or something. And sure, uh, I find it helpful just to stop and say, what am I asking right now? Mm. What Paul meant or what Christians ought to think, you know? Sure. Uh, um, uh, so that's what I mean by distinguishing them, not thinking them at the same time. I have in a different context actually uh, argued. So I'm with Akma Adam that we ought not think of these things in a foundationalist way. Mm. Um, but in a different context, I've argued that you know, even even theologians might you know find something useful in a historical critical mm. uh, monograph or commentary every so often. So sure. that, it's not. So the two I would want to think of. So I, I suppose then does it run the other way, like? historical critical scholars might find something useful in someone who's doing a more theological reading of Paul about the historical Paul. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think certainly yes, in principle. Um, There's a, well, even uh, there's another problem here, which addressed somewhat in the book, which is the, (laughs) the ambiguity at least, or maybe vagueness in the term theology. Sure. Which sometimes which we could use in an ancient descriptive sense, the, mm-hmm. the theology, our term, not his, but for what, you know, what Paul thought about God yep. uh, and maybe Jesus and maybe angels and whatever else, but his, <laughs> his, his account of yep. God and things related to God um, or, but theology also, we sometimes use to mean, you know, unstated brackets, constructive theology, yep. act, you know, um, uh, constructive or systematic, yeah. you know, what, what, yeah. uh, people who think theologically Christians, especially in the case of Paul think now or about, right. Mm. Who, this, and this is the Bar- Bart's sense Yep, who yep. God really is now, uh, in relation to us. In the well, I mean, I think Bart would say who God really is full stop, yeah. you know, not, you know, I mean, yes, surely yes. that's part of the, the wall. No. Yes, you're right. Um, so that's slippery. Um, <laughs> Right, historical critics could certainly learn from, and hopefully, well, not all uh, would be interested in theology in an ancient descriptive sense. Uh, although that is a bridge too far for some. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Um, they also would stand to gain, and there are I can think of a handful of examples of where I mean, even constructive theological readings can pay sort of backward chronologically if you like dividends to mm. making sense of a 
uh, a historical reading, mm-hmm. but that's that's a rarer bird. Mm-hmm. Right. All right. So to get into a few more specifics, we've been talking around historical criticism of Paul. Let's look at an example. Um, in Romans two, you are joining. Um, you have a great. I mean, th- I really like this chapter. You have you have a chapter on Romans two and the so-called Jew, and then um, I think it was really quite helpful to relate that to Paul's discussion of Israel in Romans 9 through 11. Um, And you're joining this sort of growing group of scholars who see the Jew or the so-called Jew um, of Romans 2 as what Matthew Thiessen has called a Gentile poser. I love that term. Although he did ruin the end of a novel, and I feel like that says something about him as a... No, I'm just kidding. Um, But it's a really helpful phrase. So this, you know, kind of Gentile poser. So, and you say, you know, for Paul, there are Jews in quotations, and there are Jews in the former, not the latter. Um, So can you just summarize the issue that you're trying to address in that chapter? Yeah. uh, I I like that you think it's a growing number of scholars. I hope that's true. I don't know if it's actually true. Well, you've you've added to it. So (laughs) there's one more scholar scholar who thinks this. So I think... It seems uh, trendy to me, at least, in the... the vein of Paul within Judaism. Yeah. Uh, I have come to think, this is the argument of that chapter, uh, well, that the way Paul talks about Israel in Romans 9 through 11, and then the way Paul talks about the one the one who's called a Jew in Romans 2, 17 and following, are different in pretty striking ways. Hmm. Uh, and I take that to mean that uh, well, as uh, as you said in that that quote, that there's different things going on in those two sections of the letter, and then in fact, there's they're relating to two different demographic groups. Um, uh, so I think that um, by the beginning of Romans three, Paul uh, begins to indict uh, Jews for sin, in particular with this. Gatina of scripture in, in uh, what is it, 3, 10 to 18. It's usually thought that Paul sort of indicts, well, some people think Paul indicts just everybody from the get-go in Romans one eighteen, right? And yeah. from there on, it's just undifferentiated humanity. Hmm. Others will say, well, in chapter one, he indicts sort of debauched Gentiles. And then in chapter two, he turns and indicts even, you know, uh, ostensibly well-behaved Jews so that by, by chapter two, you've, he's got everybody sort of, uh, and I actually think the kind of, uh, the big, uh, decisive move comes in chapter three, not in chapter two. So mm. I actually agree with probably most interpreters, but not some like, uh, not with like Lloyd Gaston, for instance, who would take a strong two covenant reading so that Paul's never indicting mm. Jews for sin. I think, uh, by Romans three, he is indicting all, uh, mortal humans Mm -hmm. but that in chapter two although it's there rhetorical not not real like it is in galatians but he's talking to a situation that's very much like what is in galatians and that is uh gentiles who imagine that they can be right wise sorted out with god by undergoing proselyte circumcision um and this is because he talks about you having the name or being called a Jew in 217 and then he brings up circumcision in 225 to 29 um so in short I think that section of the letter is addressing a situation a phenomenon which is very close to what we find in Galatians and mentioned in Philippians 3 also um and because the way Paul actually indicts Jewish people is different. Uh, so just to clarify, the the situation that you see in Romans 2 and in Philippians and in Galatians is a Gentile proselyte who is Judaizing. Yes. Okay. And so that's different from how Paul actually indicts Jews in 9 through 11. Yes. Okay. So how is it different? Uh the Gentile Judaizer for Paul is no better than a uh, Gentile in his or her natural state. And Paul just thinks they're all bad all the time. <laughs> uh, 
is how I would read it, uh, that he has a kind of, um, uh, a kind of chauvinistic in the old ethnic sense, not a gender sense mm-hmm. of, uh, uh, assumption, uh, which is present in like wisdom of Solomon, uh, for instance, that says Gentiles worship idols and they behave badly and they behave badly because they worship idols. And, uh, now some people like Philo would say, but if they just stop worshiping idols, actually they can get good. Right. <laughs> and Paul doesn't think that he's, he's, uh, he thinks there's not a therapy for it mm-hmm. other than, uh, God sending his son and filling you up with the spirit. So a much more radical kind of, mm-hmm. uh, intervention. Whereas, again, the other side of that chauvinistic assumption is that uh, Jews, although they are for Paul manifestly under sin, Romans 3, Mm -hmm. they don't behave badly most of the time because they don't worship idols. Uh, So that's why I think he doesn't, which, so in the contra, in Romans 9 to 11, the fault that he brings up again and again is apistia lack of trust or Mm -hmm. loyalty or uh, belief. Um, And this, it's just strikingly different from the stuff in Romans two about, you know, you don't practice what you preach. You say one thing, but actually you're doing bad stuff all the time. I, I, as I read it across the letters, he doesn't talk about Jews doing misbehaving most of the time. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it's because he thinks, you know, this is a, this is a rabbinic trope too, that there's a kind of, uh, all humans are sinners, but uh, Israel has a kind of prophylaxis, which was the covenant at Sinai. Like mm-hmm. uh, that, their their sort of their worst impulses are put in check because they've met God. They have a revelation of God. They have mm-hmm. instruction in God's ways, and that's why they don't act out like idolaters do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's basically Paul's view. But then the main thing that Paul wants to get on to talking about is that actually. Uh, like that's he thinks that's empirically the case about how Jews and Gentiles behave, but all are under sin, and that no one is like delivered from this. Mm. The ultimate problem that everybody's still stuck with, even Jews who have mm. the covenant with God, is sin and death. Mm. And there's no way of getting past that, right? Uh, short of God ending the evil age and bringing in. Oh, well, now you sound like Beverly. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay, I have two questions about that because I want, in some ways, I think that that reading, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense. I appreciate how attentive you are to the details in Romans 9 through 11, verses 2. Um, I think, help me understand who is called the Jew in secret, in, you know, at the end of 2. Because I, I, I feel like what, what you said in the chapter, and maybe I just didn't read it very carefully enough, is that Paul is happy to countenance, in some sense, Christ following Gentiles as the ones who are doing the law. Mm. Is that right? Did I re- did I catch that? Uh, Christ following Gentiles, Gentiles who have the Spirit of God inside them, can then uh, just find themselves doing the things of the law. So, which I would I would coordinate this with like a. Uh, uh, Galatians five and six, yep. fruit of the spirit, fulfilling yep. fulfilling the law of Christ. Yep. Um, so yes. But does that mean that we have to say that Paul is somehow saying that they're the Jew in secret, or is Absolutely that like not. okay? I was <laughs> like, so how does this? Because I don't feel like you ever say anything about yeah, who the Jew in secret is. So what I think, and I think what I try to say in, in that it, chapter, yeah, but what I think is um, <laughs> the the contrast in Romans five twenty, excuse me, Romans two. Mm. 25 to 29 yeah is between the jew in secret and the jew on display yeah um and that i argue is actually more or less the same contrast it's entirely inner jewish actually it's, okay. um it's the same contrast that's in uh the sermon on the mount between okay. those who do their piety on display for okay. the approval of humans and those who do their piety in secret uh for the uh approval of their father in heaven okay which in the Sermon on the Mount is between it's it's all right yeah uh, Jewish people in the room who who know what it means to sort of do piety toward yeah. God alms and prayers and so yeah. on and I think Paul's basically and that contrast is there in Deuteronomy and Jeremiah and yeah. so on too yeah. um, and that Paul's talking about that he's saying 
he's not yet talking about pneumatic Gentiles sure. being so Jews in secret just means like in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, those who are doing their piety for public approval versus for God's approval. And the difference between that and the Sermon on the Mount is Paul thinks that uh, posers, that mm -hmm. is Judaizing Gentiles, yeah. they are scare quote Jews, ones who are called or have the name of Jew by virtue of proselyte circumcision. Yeah. But he thinks that is ostentatious. He thinks that is human okay. approval seeking. Right. Um, so the, the, the Jew in secret just means it's like a hypothetical construct it's not uh i mean it's he would he, he'd probably say he's one uh or other like he'd probably say his his mother is one like a pious okay jewish person who uh right uh yeah so basically if this gentile poser actually understood judaism they wouldn't be flaunting their circumcision as Yes. So I do. I, I argue that Paul thinks that any proselyte circumcision is ostentatious. Sure. Is for human approval. Right. Um, so in a way, according to my argument, 217 through 29, you could think of it, it's kind of an aside mm -hmm. considering the case of, okay. but it's, it's an aside about a phenomenon that was really significant to Paul, as we know from Galatians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is people who somehow got the idea, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Gentiles who got the idea that what they need to be justified is proselyte circumcision. Right. And we know that this is a uh, a bugbear for Paul. It is the problem in Galatians. It's on the horizon in Philippians. And I just think in 2.17 to 29, it's actually about that. Mm. Um, he goes on in Romans yeah, 3 yeah. to uh, sort of wrap up all humanity under sin. So in this case, I... Uh, there, I eventually end up, I suppose, with a majority on reading Romans 1 to 3, but I, I defer it late to <laughs> later in that. Right. So just to be really clear, Matt Novenson does think that Paul thinks that Jews are also under sin, just not in Romans 2, right? Yes. So that's fair. We need to see. Yeah, it needs to see. So um, I, I guess the other question I have about um, kind of this, there seems to be within the Paul and Judaism school, a, a a sort of reticence to see Paul as criticizing Judaism in a sense, which I think is, um, I think is right. But then what, what do we do? Um, Cause I mean, we talked a lot about Galatians. There's some strong words of criticism for Jewish Christ followers, particularly Peter in that letter. How do we understand that within the Paul within Judaism matrix? Yeah. Uh, so the first thing I'd say is, uh, I mean, I think the case of uh, Peter or Cephas, who I think are the same person, well, there's Sorry. a bit about that, but yeah, in, <laughs> in Galatians 2, uh, actually, I think confirms this, uh, well, confir confirms the impression I have of like that account mm -hmm. from Romans 1 to 3, where... Um, what Paul scolds Peter for uh, in Galatians 2 is hypocrisy. Mm. Uh, and then the others, like Barnabas, who went along with them. Mm -hmm. And what I find really interesting about that is it means, hypocrisy means they knew better and they did it anyway. It does, And, and this, I think, is hugely significant for the, uh, the hypothesis that there's sort of a Pauline gospel and then a Jewish Christian uh, you know Petrine or their way of thinking which in its classical FC Bowerian form has mm -hmm. is not widely current nowadays although in shadow form there's lots of versions of this that I think are still mm -hmm. um, I think so Paul says and now <laughs> some some critics would say yeah but he would he would say that it's just but he says that uh, Peter actually agrees with him in principle um, that they shook hands in Jerusalem, that James too agrees with him in principle. And I actually think that's plausible that uh, certainly that Paul thinks they really did, maybe that they actually had this agreement so that when Peter does something that he thinks goes afoul of it, it's Peter's not wrong because he holds a differing hmm. account. He's wrong because he holds the same account and he, and, and he got, he, he got scared. He, he, 
couple so who scared them else. like who's who's who led peter the people from james yeah those from the circumcision which i take to being uh not circumcisers but the so they are jewish or judean mm. well they're jewish and judean in this case i think mm. is interesting okay. that there's a i think there's a uh a kind of halakhic uh dispute about what counts as proximity to idols and idolatry when you're in the diaspora as opposed to when you're mm. in judea i think that that's probably the um so the upshot of that is that I don't think Paul is criticizing, you know, Jewish Christians or Jewish Christianity or anything like that. Mm. I think he's criticizing uh, Peter for going back on what he had indeed agreed to. That like, uh, that theologically they're on the that he said. I thought we were on the same page here. What are you doing? Um. Yeah, which I take to mean that actually there's not a. Uh, I think the quest for a critique of Judaism or even a critique of Jewish Christianity, quote unquote, quote unquote in Paul is, uh, they're, mm. they're equally dead ends <laughs> in my view. Right. Um, I suppose I have, I have one more question sort of in this vein, um, sort of in this vein, but you, I think in the last chapter of your book, one of the, one of the last two chapters, you say that um, basically a new perspective like they need, like every every reading of Paul in essence has has a bad guy in it has like a, a thing that Paul defeats, right? So, you know, within the traditional or Lutheran reading, you know, there's works righteousness of some kind, legalism. Within the new perspective, there's ethnocentrism. Who's the bad guy in Paul within Judaism? <laughs> uh... Or is there one? The only group so, without a bad guy. That's right. The, uh, so one problem with answering the question is, it, and I think I say this in one of the essays in the book, the problem is uh, I find it really hard to generalize about the Paul within Judaism school just because uh, not just on peripheral issues, but on some like central questions, <laughs> John Gager does not agree with Paula Fredrickson, does not agree with Pam Eisenbaum, does not agree sure. with Mark Nanos and so on. So it's very hard to generalize. I mean, if you just put it that way, who's the bad guy in Paul within Judaism readings? <laughs> I mean, it's often the sort of like the ghost of Luther or something. <laughs> so in that way, it's kind of like yeah, complain yeah. in the same way new perspective scholars complain. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. But uh, that's not that's not a bad guy in the in the way you were uh, no you meant it in the question. So there's not I think there's not a Paul within Judaism party line on this. I know what my view is, and some other. I mean, I think okay. So who's your bad? Guy? So I think uh, and. At least, like Thiessen and Fredrickson, I think would agree with me on this. Uh, the of all his brilliant insights, Ed Sanders' most brilliant insight as an interpreter of Paul was that uh, there's no Paul never like retro diagnoses a problem in Judaism. Mm. That it really is just Jesus. The the what's different about Paulinism and Judaism is Jesus, <laughs> which is a, a, a very, very simple idea, but extremely profound, right? Yeah. Uh, that, and, and this is what I think, what I, in Romans 9 to 11, this is what it all comes down to. I think this, the, the stone over which Israel stumbles, I think is Jesus, the crucified Messiah, Jesus. Mm. It's just Jesus. It's not that, oh, they'd gotten in the habit of using the, the law the wrong way that it had yeah, yeah. you know devolved from sort of a pure ethical monotheism to a sort of you know legalistic system yeah uh, or that you know like uh, a la jimmy dunn that they had turned the law into a mm -hmm. sort of uh you know a wall to keep the gentiles out or a, a cudgel to beat the gentiles with or anything like that i think there is zero of that in paul of of kind of mm -hmm. retro diagnosing a problem in judaism he, uh, the way Sanders put it, which is not quite how I'd put it, is Paul's only problem with Judaism is it's not Christianity. <laughs> uh, I don't, uh, I think there's, for some purposes, it's helpful not to think of what Paul's selling as Christianity. Uh, but I, I don't actually care that much about the term. The point is just that uh, Paul's 
the the only stumbling block is Jesus, the crucified Messiah, and not mm. some other problem that he thinks is endemic in Jewish piety. Just, do you think Paul has an an endemic problem that he sees retrospectively in light of the Christ event? Like, is does Romans three give us a a sense of the Pauline problem then? Yes. And I, I mean, I'd go even further in this way. This is very uh, old school, like, I mean, historic <laughs> Christian interpretation is it's not even just retrospective. It, you could even think of it as prospective in that, mm. I mean, sin and death, Romans 5, mm. is a kind of another word for the human condition. Sure. Before the eschaton, before like, mm. and uh, so... Again, I don't think Paul singles out Judaism and says he has a problem with it, but the thing that Judaism and debauched Gentiles and Romans one have in common is we all die. Mm. And for Paul, if you die, then you also sin. So all mortals sin. Mm -hmm. uh, so what you need uh, is what he calls life everlasting. Uh, I mean, you need resurrection, mm -hmm. immortality. That's how you get free of sin. So. Uh, I just don't think Paul sort of faults Judaism for not providing that mm. because he says, mm -hmm. I mean, that's obviously, that's the, the only reason there's a Messiah is because God has to send the Messiah to raise the dead. And that hadn't been done yet uh, until, until he did send it. That's, that's the thing for Paul. Right. What are your hopes for this book for Paul that and now? Uh Wow. I mean, if I were to, if I were to single out one, because the book is in a way, so very, it's a bit meta, it's very hermeneutical. I mean, we started with hermeneutical relativism. I, I would, uh, I would be happy if, uh, you know, it, it sort of built a few bridges amongst some different readings and readers of Paul's letters that I think could actually stand to sort of learn from one another. As as I have learned from a lot of those conversations, so maybe something like you know breaking down some of those SBL silos a little <laughs> bit. I would be really happy if if I could nudge anyone in that direction. Mm. Um, I also wouldn't mind if anyone bought any of my particular readings. <laughs> uh, uh, so we'll see we'll see about that. But at a at a macro level, I. Um, Definitely a goal and a cutting edge in the book is to try to uh, say that all of us, whatever our various commitments, you know, could stand to learn from one another and, and, and mm. in different uh, ways of reading. Great. Well, friends, that's all we have time for today. We've been speaking to Dr. Matthew Nowinson about his new book, um, Paul Then and Now, which was published by Erdman's again in 2022. Matt, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, this was fun. Thank you. And uh, thanks for all of you uh, for listening. And we'll see you next time. You have been listening to OnScript, delectable conversations on scripture and theology. If this episode has brought you inner peace or lit your biblical fire, please consider a small donation of just 2 or $5 per month. Information on how to donate can be found at onscript.study slash donate.